It begins with a shudder in the deep, a sudden rupture far beneath the cold waters of the Pacific Ocean, a place where one tectonic plate is forced relentlessly beneath another. In that instant, stress that has been silently accumulating for centuries is violently released, and the Cascadia subduction zone, stretching nearly 1,000 kilometers, about 620 miles from Northern California to Vancouver Island, lets loose a megathrust earthquake of magnitude 9.0 or more. Models show the shaking could last four to six minutes, swaying buildings in Portland, Seattle and Vancouver like metronome arms, and sending a wall of seawater up to 30 metres 100 feet high racing toward the coast within minutes. The 1700 Cascadia earthquake, recorded not in diaries but in drowned forests and Japanese tsunami logs, was such an event, and geologists know it will happen again. But in the popular imagination, one question often rises alongside visions of crumpled highways and flooded harbours. Could such a quake wake the great volcanoes of the Cascade Range? The Cascade Range is a formidable chain of volcanoes stretching roughly 1,300 kilometres, about 800 miles from Mount Lassen in Northern California to Mount Garibaldi in British Columbia. Many peaks rise above 3,000 metres, about 10,000 feet, with Mount Rainier topping the list at 4,392 metres, 14,411 feet. These cones, glaciers clinging to their flanks, are not mere mountains. They are outlets of the same geologic process that drives the subduction zone offshore. As the oceanic Juan de Fuca plate dives beneath North America, it carries water and other volatiles deep into the mantle, where the rock partially melts. The buoyant magma rises, feeding the volcanic arc that parallels the coast. The Cascadia subduction zone and the Cascade volcanoes are, in geological terms, different faces of the same tectonic coin. The drama of their connection has long fueled speculation. If a megathrust quake were to rip along the subduction zone, the shaking would be felt far inland, where magma reservoirs simmer quietly beneath the peaks. The analogy often used by volcanologists is a shaken soda bottle. If the bottle is already fizzing to the brim, even a small tap can send foam bursting out, but if the bottle is half empty or flat, no amount of shaking will make it overflow. The United States Geological Survey, USGS, puts it plainly, earthquakes can trigger eruptions only if a volcano is already primed with enough pressurized magma close to the surface. Without that readiness, even the most powerful quake will not conjure an eruption from nothing. History offers intriguing, if rare, hints of such cause and effect. The 1700 Cascadia earthquake coincided with an eruption of Tsiak's Cone in northern British Columbia, whose lava flows killed thousands in Niska'a villages. Radiocarbon dating of charred wood and buried soil suggests the eruption occurred between 1668 and 1714, squarely overlapping the megathrust event. A 2009 study by volcanologist Michael Higgins proposed that the quake may have rejuvenated an existing magmatic system under Tsiak's pushing it over the edge. Within the Cascade Range itself, no clear record links the 1700 earthquake to an eruption. Mount St. Helens's famous 1980 eruption, for instance, came after decades of dormancy and was triggered by magma ascent and gas expansion, not by any large tectonic quake. Nor did the 1964 magnitude 9.2 Alaska earthquake which sent seismic waves through the Pacific Northwest, spark activity in the Cascades. Even the 2011 magnitude 9.0 Tohoku earthquake in Japan, powerful enough to send long-period seismic waves around the globe, left the Cascade volcanoes quiet, despite causing measurable ground motion here. This absence of obvious triggers does not mean the possibility can be dismissed. Large earthquakes can influence volcanoes through two main mechanisms. Dynamic stress and static stress changes. Dynamic stress is the immediate effect of seismic waves shaking the rock around and within a magma chamber. If magma is rich in dissolved gas and already near the pressure needed to break through overlying rock, that jolt can cause gas to exsolve, forming bubbles that expand and raise pressure further. Static stress changes, on the other hand, occur when the earthquake's fault slip permanently alters the surrounding stress field. Some areas are compressed, others are stretched, 
In volcanic systems, such changes can open new pathways for magma ascent or close existing ones. Harold Tobin, a University of Washington seismologist and director of the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, explains that an earthquake can shake loose the system that then allows a volcano to actually erupt, but only if that system is already primed. He points to examples from Kamchatka, Russia, where a magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquake on July 29th and 30, 2025, was followed by eruptions at nearby volcanoes. Eruptions scientists believe were already imminent, with the quake acting as a final push. Yet the distances involved in Cascadia make things less straightforward. The subduction fault lies offshore, sometimes more than 100 kilometers, about 62 miles from the nearest Cascade volcano. By the time seismic waves reach those volcanoes, their energy is diminished compared to what coastal towns would endure. And magma chambers in the Cascades often lie several kilometers beneath the surface, insulated from shallow crustal stress changes. This separation is one reason many geologists believe a Cascadia quake would be more likely to cause landslides, ice collapses, or small phreatic steam blasts on volcano flanks than a full-scale magmatic eruption. Mount Rainier is a prime example of such secondary hazards. Towering over the Puget Sound lowlands, its flanks are loaded with loose volcanic rock and glacier ice. A strong quake could destabilize these slopes, sending lahars, fast-moving mudflows, racing down valleys toward towns like Orting and Puyallup, even without an eruption. The USGS classifies Rainier as the most dangerous volcano in the United States, not because it erupts frequently, but because its potential for lahars could devastate densely populated areas with little warning. Today, monitoring networks across the Cascades are designed to detect even subtle changes that could hint at magma movement. The USGS Cascades Volcano Observatory, along with universities and partner agencies, operate seismometers, GPS receivers, gas sensors and cameras on many of the peaks. At present, all Cascade volcanoes show only background seismicity and no signs of impending eruption. That baseline matters. If Cascadia were to rupture tomorrow, scientists would be watching for sudden increases in quake swarms beneath any volcano, rapid ground deformation or spikes in volcanic gas emissions, all of which could signal that dynamic or static stress changes were having an effect. Still, the unpredictability of Earth systems leaves room for humility. The Earth doesn't read our textbooks, volcanologist Alexa Van Eaton remarked in a recent interview, noting that while statistical patterns and physics guide expectations, rare events do occur. She underscores that the average eruption rate in the Cascades over the last 4,000 years has been about two per century, with seven volcanoes erupting since 1700. That's not zero, she says. It's rare on human timescales, but these volcanoes are geologically active. In any scenario, the overlapping hazards of earthquake and volcano demand joint planning. The Pacific Northwest Seismic Network and the USGS maintain coordinated emergency protocols so that if a major quake occurs, the state of each volcano will be assessed within hours. Even if no eruption follows, strong shaking could damage monitoring stations complicating detection of changes later on. The geological story is one of shared origin but independent behavior. Cascadia's subduction zone feeds the magmatic systems beneath the Cascades, but those systems operate on their own pressure, temperature and gas timelines. A megathrust quake may be a dramatic basin-wide event, yet for a volcano it is just one more stress among many. Whether that stress is enough to break the rock above a magma chamber depends entirely on what was already happening underground before the first seismic wave arrived. A close look at other subduction zones reveals why this relationship is so nuanced. In Chile, for example, the magnitude 8.8 .8 Maul earthquake in 2010 shook the Andean volcanic arc, and while a few volcanoes showed increased activity afterward, none erupted immediately. In Japan, following the 2011 magnitude 9.0 Tohoku earthquake, several volcanoes, including Shinmodake, experienced changes in seismicity and gas emissions, but the eruptions that followed were already in motion before the quake struck. These cases illustrate the patterns seen worldwide. Great earthquakes can tip an already unstable system into eruption, but rarely do they awaken a fully dormant one. One reason lies in the anatomy of a volcano. 
A magma reservoir is not a single balloon-like cavity. It is a complex network of molten pockets, crystal mush and pressurized gas pathways extending kilometers below the surface. The pressure needed to fracture overlying rock depends not only on the amount of magma, but on its viscosity, gas content and temperature. Basaltic magma, like that in Hawaii or Iceland, can move quickly through cracks opened by an earthquake. In contrast, the Cascades often host more viscous andesitic or dacitic magma, which tends to rise sluggishly and requires sustained pressure build-up to erupt. This rheology makes them less sensitive to short-term stress jolts from distant quakes. Even so, geophysical modelling has shown that a full-length Cascadia rupture could alter the stress field under certain Cascade peaks by a few tenths of a megapascal, a small but measurable change. In a magmatic system balanced on the brink, that could be enough to hasten an eruption by days, weeks or months. In practical terms, this means that while a megathrust earthquake might not cause an eruption on the same day, it could subtly accelerate a process already underway. The difficulty, as always, is knowing which volcanoes are ripe before the quake happens. Monitoring plays a key role here. Modern networks are far more sensitive than anything available in 1700, allowing scientists to detect swarms of tiny earthquakes, bulging of a volcano's flanks by mere millimetres, and minute changes in volcanic gas chemistry. These data sets feed into hazard models used by emergency planners. In simulation exercises, a scenario where a Cascadia quake coincides with renewed activity at one or more Cascade volcanoes is considered low probability but high consequence. The compound disaster, quake damage, tsunami impact and volcanic unrest would strain infrastructure, communications and emergency response. The human factor magnifies the stakes. Millions of people live within range of both Cascadia's seismic reach and the hazards posed by its volcanoes. Cities like Portland, Seattle and Tacoma lie within Lahar zones for Mount Hood and Mount Rainier. Major interstate highways and rail lines cross volcanic valleys, meaning that even a small eruption or landslide could disrupt recovery after an earthquake. This interdependence is why agencies stress all hazards preparedness, teaching communities to respond not just to shaking, but to potential evacuation orders if volcanic slopes destabilize. There's also the cultural and historical dimension. Indigenous nations across the Pacific Northwest have oral traditions that describe both great shaking and volcanic activity, sometimes in the same narrative arc. While these accounts predate written records, and cannot always be tied to specific geological events, they underscore that human memory of these landscapes is deep, and that the connection between mountains and earthquakes is not a modern invention. In Niskar oral history, the Seax eruption and the loss of life it caused are still told more than three centuries later, serving as both a cautionary tale and a cultural touchstone. For scientists, the main challenge is not proving that earthquakes and eruptions can be linked, that is well established in global studies, but quantifying the risk in a given region and time frame. The Pacific Northwest's relative seismic quiet in the last century is deceptive. Strain has been building on the Cascadia Fault for hundreds of years. Likewise, many Cascade volcanoes have not erupted in living memory, but geologically speaking their dormancy is temporary. This mismatch between human timelines and geologic cycles is one reason hazard communication can be difficult. It is hard to convince the public to prepare for an event that may not happen in their lifetime, yet could happen tomorrow. Weston Thelen, a USGS volcano seismologist, puts it succinctly, the question isn't whether the Cascadia subduction zone will rupture again or whether the Cascade volcanoes will erupt again. It's whether those things will happen close enough in time to influence each other in a way that matters for public safety. This framing captures the scientific consensus. The two systems are connected, but their clocks are not synchronized. From a policy perspective, the implication is straightforward. Planning must account for both hazards independently and for the possibility, however remote, of them overlapping. Investments in monitoring infrastructure, public education, and emergency coordination pay dividends regardless of whether a quake triggers an eruption. For example, Lahar detection systems on Rainier and Mount Hood can provide critical minutes of warning to downstream communities. 
whether the trigger is an earthquake, heavy rain, or magma intrusion. In the final analysis, when Cascadia snaps, the Cascade volcanoes will indeed feel it. Instruments will record their vibrations, slopes may shed snow and rock, and in rare cases, magma systems already on the verge could cross the threshold into eruption. But for most peaks, the earthquake will pass without immediate fiery consequence. As the USGS reminds the public, earthquakes can sometimes trigger volcanic eruptions, but only if the volcano has enough eruptible magma already in place. In other words, the mountains will listen to the quake, but whether they answer depends entirely on what was already brewing beneath the surface. That truth carries both reassurance and warning. The reassurance is that a Cascadia megathrust earthquake will not automatically unleash a string of eruptions. The warning is that every Cascade volcano will eventually erupt in its own time, with or without a seismic shove from offshore. Preparedness, therefore, cannot hinge on a single scenario. It must embrace the full spectrum of possibilities that life atop a subduction zone entails. The Pacific Northwest story is still being written in the language of geology, in millimetres of plate movement per year, in the gas content of fumaroles, in the slow cooling of ancient lava domes. When the day comes that Cascadia breaks again, the outcome for the Cascades will be determined not by chance alone, but by the hidden state of each volcanic system at that exact moment. Until then, the best defence is knowledge, readiness and respect for the restless earth beneath our feet. If you found this deep dive into Cascadia's seismic volcanic relationship informative, take a moment to like, share and subscribe. Staying informed and helping others do the same is a small but vital part of preparing for the big events that sooner or later will shape our region's future.